Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast, episode 19. I'm dropping this episode a lot earlier than usual so I can focus on my new job for the next week. I hope this doesn't disrupt anyone's podcast listening schedule. The things you learn in this podcasting game. The section on strawberry last week was recorded while I was lying on my back on the sofa. This had a very deadening effect on the sound, so I won't be doing that again. I also had to unpublish and re-edit the last episode twice as I forgot to remove an outtake. Sorry if this messed with your feed. It is possible you will hear a brief repeated section. We live and learn. In particular, I'm learning that edits post-publishing don't always make it through on the RSS feed. Resubscribing to the podcast should sort this problem out, and I promise not to do it again. As I've just started a new job, I may keep episodes a little bit simpler in structure for a while, as I don't want quality to be compromised by my other commitments. Anyway, on with the episode. It's a bit of a heavy one, I'm afraid. Chapter 21. For Elechre Ra to Cry. When I was a boy, I discovered a warren on the edge of a wheat field on the downs behind our house. For a few weeks I'd regularly go and observe the rabbits quietly, recording their numbers and behaviour in a set of notes I still have. Their feeding encroached a little way into the wheat crop, but hardly enough to justify what happened next. Well, I don't think so. One day I arrived at the warren to find it gone. Just gone. All the holes had been filled in and there wasn't a rabbit in sight. I have never forgotten how that felt, and it makes this chapter all the more poignant for me. The chapter is the first in the book to open with two quotes. The first, by Dostoevsky, concerns avoiding cruelty to animals. The second, from W. H. Auden, concerns how unjust acts lie like bones in history. The title of the chapter, interestingly, appears to be a quotation that no one in the book actually uses, as if it is reported from a conversation that takes place afterwards. Holly, sitting in the warmth of the honeycomb on Watership Down, begins his account by saying what happened in the immediate aftermath of the group leaving Sandalford. He says they sent out a search to the brook. However, if that just meant the small channel that runs near the site of the warren, that wouldn't make for much of a search. In any case, the search was quickly called off. The following day, there were a lot of rumours about Fiverr saying something bad was coming. However, the Threa Ra, the chief rabbit, dismissed small rabbits like Fiverr as just pretending to have powers of prophecy in order to compensate for their small size. In any case, even if something bad were coming, the practicalities of the whole warren leaving were impossible. The power to see such things coming is rare, but it does exist, he admitted. But acting upon such warnings is another matter. Fiverr interrupts Holly to admit he hadn't thought this through at the time. All he could feel was terror, the same as he felt at the Warren of the Snares. Holly continues by saying that the evil in the world comes from men, as he puts it. He distinguishes them from the Elil, who are just trying to survive, while humans will not rest until they have spoiled the earth. Holly continues that on the next day there was rain. This was the day the group that left had reached the Warren of the Snares. As he went outside to pass Fracker, he saw a group of men approach the Warren. They looked at all the holes, but didn't seem to have guns or ferrets, the main things rabbits fear from men. It is interesting that Adams seems to grant rabbits a full understanding of what a gun is and what it can do. All the men had done was poke some earth down in each hole. The next day was very different. Many rabbits were out at Silflay, and Holly decided to go raiding for lettuce on his own. As he returned at Nefrith, or midday, he noticed a hoodoo-doo in the lane near the warren. A lot of men were getting out of it, as well as a boy with a gun. That last detail lets you know that this is truly from a time before our own, another reminder that this book is now half a century old, another being that all the men rabbits see seem to smoke. The men carried long, heavy objects into the field, and the rabbits who were outside went underground. But Holly stayed put as he assumed they were going to use nets and ferrets, 
so that was the worst place to be. After a while, one of them started filling in the entrances of all the holes he could find. If they were using ferrets, they would have left holes open and put nets over them, so this was something very different. Holly's pointing out how useless it is to have a ferret chase a rabbit up a blocked run is too much for Pipkin, and Hazel asks him not to make his description too grim. Holly comments that he has barely started, and asks her if anyone would like to leave. None of them do. He continues that another man fetched some things he hasn't got words for. They were long, thin and bending, like lengths of bramble. One of these was attached to each of the long, heavy objects. Then Holly says that there was a hissing sound, and the air started to, quote, turn bad. The heavy objects were clearly gas canisters. The brambles were hoses. Holly says he got a smell of whatever was spoiling the air, and it nearly made him run out from under cover in the wood from which he was observing. He abandoned any idea of warning the three R R about what was happening. The men put one of the hoses in each of the holes they had not blocked up. After a while, Holly saw a rabbit called Scabius come out of a hole that the men had missed. He was obviously affected by the gas. The boy shot him, but he was not killed and just screamed until a man picked him up and hit him. Then the hole he came out of was blocked. Holly says the poisoned air must have been spreading through all the runs and burrows. Bluebell, who was underground, takes over the story. His jokey demeanour is gone. He says the does seemed to be affected by the gas first. They tried to get out, apart from the ones with kittens who started attacking anyone who came near them. The runs started to fill up with rabbits trying to claw and clamber over each other to use ways out that no longer existed. Then rabbits lower down the run started to die and were torn apart by rabbits still trying to get out. Bluebell explains how lucky he was in being able to escape. The gas wasn't working in the open run he was in and he managed to keep his senses and turn back down to an old deep run called the Slack Run. At times he had to dig his way through. Meanwhile, terrible sounds were coming down shafts from above. Then a rabbit called Celandine fell down a shaft and Bluebell had to tear at his body to get past. From the description so far, the gas the men were using seems to have been lighter than air, so the deeper a rabbit was, the safer from the gas they were. Surely this would not be the best gas to use. Did Adams research the kind of gas used for exterminating rabbit rabbit warrens at that time? It would be interesting to know. Bluebell continues that he found himself with another rabbit called Pimpernel who had been affected by the gas. Pimpernel knew the way out, but needed Bluebell's help to get there. Bluebell was terrified Pimpernel would die and block the run ahead, so he kept shoving him and even had to bite him once. Eventually they smelled fresher air and emerged from a hole in the woods. Holly takes up the story again. The men had not blocked the holes in the wood for some reason. Every rabbit bar two who came out in the field was shot, but the woods were a different matter. Holly realised three other rabbits were in the wood with him. They sat tight. Eventually the men took the hoses out of the holes and the boy put all the dead rabbits on a stick. This detail is too much for Holly, who stops for a moment. Hazel asks him to tell how they came to leave. Holly then describes what is clearly a JCB having come into the field and dug it up. This concept is incomprehensible to the rabbits, but he insists it destroyed the field. In describing this, it is clear that among the earth it dug up were the bodies of rabbits. Holly realised no one would be joining them who had not already got out. Going back into the wood, he was joined by Bluebell, Pimpernel and Toadflax, the Owsler member who bullied Fiverr out of eating a cowslip in Chapter 1. Throughout his telling of what happened, Holly is clearly deeply upset about not having been able to help the Freya Ra, who no one had seen. He says he hopes he died quickly. His sense of duty and not having been able to fulfil it has clearly weighed on him very badly. 
They were all affected by the gas, and all Holly could think about was finding Bigwig so he could apologise to him. He had been ready to kill him on the night the group departed, so this idea consumed him. That night they made it to the wood. During the night Toadflax died, but for, before he did he made a comment about how the men did what they did because the rabbits were just in their way. Getting to the river, the remaining three rabbits found the place where Hazel's group had crossed the Enborn, by the tracks and three-a-day-old hacker. There they crossed too. He describes crossing the road and coming to the common, where they found more three-day-old hacker. How were they following where they went? By tracks alone? By smell? Or just by following a hacker trail? In any case, they too have a hard time on the common. Pimpernel was feverish, and Holly was afraid he would die too. They met a Hlessy, a homeless rabbit on the edge of the common, who directed them to a nearby warren. They fell asleep, exhausted, and woke up the next day to find themselves surrounded by rabbits from the warren of the snares. One of these rabbits was Cowslip. As soon as Holly mentioned the names of the rabbits they were looking for, Cowslip ordered them torn to pieces. Funny how this was a warren without a chief rabbit, eh? Holly got his ear ripped badly in the fighting, but he and Bluebill got away easily, as these were rabbits who, despite their size, couldn't really fight. But Pimpernel was left behind and must have been killed. Holly is disgusted that after all they had been through, he was killed by rabbits. Strawberry who joined Hazel's group from the Warren of the Snares, interrupts to calmly make it clear how he feels about this. As they were pursued, Holly decided to take on Cowslip, who was nearest. He pinned him down to kill him, but Cowslip saved his skin by telling Holly where Hazel's group had headed, to the high hills to the south. He let him go with a scratch. Then the going got really hard. Holly's ripped ear was painful and Bluebell kept him going by joking with him the whole time. Now Holly had the deaths of the Freya Ra and Pimpernel on his conscience. He blamed himself for sleeping, even though he was exhausted. But he could not sleep now for the bad dreams he would have, and lapsed into delirium. All he could think about was finding Bigwig to tell him he had been right to leave. They had stopped caring about the Alil. When they reached the foot of Watership Down and Bigwig was not there to greet him, his mind finally went. It is an excellent description of utter delirious despair. Holly hallucinated Scabius, the Threara, Toadflax and Pimpernel, all dead or Zorn, as he had cried out. It was a happy coincidence that Bigwig was indeed close by to hear him. In the real world, a war and conflict, such coincidences are all too rare, I suspect, and often people never get to find out what happened to their sandalhoods. By this time, Holly just wanted to be killed by the Alil. He comments that although he wasn't the Black Rabbit of Inlay, he was as close as it was possible to be to him. He closes by saying how grateful he is to be here with them all, and tells Bigwig that the rabbit who tried to arrest him at Sandalford was another rabbit, a long time ago. Holly gets his closure at last, in one of the most poignant moments in the whole book. In the next episode, the rabbits react to Holly's account. Hazel explains making friends with mice. And Bluebell tells a story of Elechrera.